Good morning, everyone. Morning. Brian, where's the cup hit? <laughs> um, <laughs> not on my head right now. <laughs> Yeah, for these, um, I usually dress up at least a little bit, at least on my top half, you know? And I always look at them like, okay, do I, do I actually need to iron this thing? Nah. Okay. Now, Alex, are you going to be taking care of uh, letting people in and out? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Perfect. We are live and we will. Um, begin the call let's give it about five or six minutes to let everybody um get on perfect and all those that are participants signed in um we can't hear you or see you but if you want to use the q a and chat functions um to ask your questions throughout the throughout the webinar that would be great
Good morning, everyone. We're going to give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Um, for all those that have called in, thank you for joining us. Um, as a participant, you are muted and don't have video on. Our speakers will just have video and, and sound, but you can definitely participate through the Q&A and chat. Um, so we're going to give it another three to four minutes and then we'll get started. All right, so it looks like we have a good amount of people on the call. We can go ahead and get started. As a reminder to all participants, um, you are muted and your video is not showing, but we encourage you to use the Q&A and chat features to ask any questions as we go through the presentation. And um, we'll ask them either throughout the presentation or at the end. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Collins. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our July virtual webinar featuring global water technology. I'm excited to uh, be able to set this up today, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Brian Burgess, uh, Director of Compliance and Education for GWT. Um, global Water has been a longtime member and supporter of the uh, Chief Engineers Association, um, and we're really excited to have Brian here with us today. Uh, Brian's knowledge of domestic water systems is extraordinary, um, and he'll be up for answering any and all water-related questions you may have. Um, please make sure that you reach out to Brian with any questions, comments, or concerns. He and his team would welcome the opportunity to visit your facility. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Brian. I, Brian and I have worked for probably the last uh, six years together. He knows more about water treatment than any person I've ever met my entire life and enjoys it even more than that. So he's a, <laughs> he's a wealth of knowledge and, uh, and he's always um, open and available to, uh, to answer any question I've ever had. So, you know, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Mike. Um, and thanks everyone here at the Chief Engineers Association. Um, for letting me do this webinar today and for being part of this. Um, one of the great things I just love about the chief engineers is first off, looking at your motto, um, there is always a better way to do something, I believe is how that motto goes. And um, that's just one of the things I love about working with all of the engineers who are members here. And um, so thank you again for letting me do this. And um, a little bit about who Global Water is, in case you're not um, familiar, we've actually been around since 1990. And uh, for a lot of it, we are just a local Chicagoland company, um, but we've grown over the last several years. Um, from when I've started, we were a company, um, you know, that had a small office, and now we have a full um, manufacturing facility in Chicagoland that can supply um, any of your chemistries that you need you know, almost overnight. And we also are now a coast to coast operation with um, offices spanning, you know, over five states. And um, we're opening up to more and more locations every single day. And with that, our goal is still primarily to think about, think big, but also think small. So um, think about the big picture and growing coast to coast and getting a nationwide um, footprint, but also keep in mind that 
or here because of individual customers and solving individual problems. Um, about myself, I've been a certified water technologist, CWT, since 2017, but um, I'm actually second generation in water treatment. And um, so my industry experience, I say 10 plus years, but really I've been uh, sort of born into it all my life. But I've also been an instructor and speaker. Um, most recently was at um, a class that we held at International Union of Operating Engineers down in Houston area. Um, Boma Chicago and Boma Phoenix were some of my most recent. And of course, I've been um, a speaker at several seminars at Local 399. Um, one thing we're a proud member of is AWT. I mentioned this um, certified WAR technologists. We have a education arm that's through um, Association of WAR Technologies as they're an international WAR treatment company that represents over 500 companies. And they provide us with support, training, certification, um, even regulatories. Um, and um, recommendations through that. So it's one of the great association we're part of. So when you hear um, some of the things I'm saying today, you may be using Global Water, you may be using someone else. Um, and of course, I hope you uh, consider using Global Water at your next time you're going to think about water treatment. But all the information I'm telling you today is not just solely related to Global Water and what the way we do things. It's related to water treatment in general and the purpose of this is to help you out and help you run your systems more efficiently. If it um, goes through using Global Water, that's fantastic. If you're using someone else, the one thing I'll ask you, ask how many certified water technologists they have on staff. A certified water technologist means a person can be airdropped anywhere in the world to just treat water. So um, by having those people on staff, I'm very confident you're getting an excellent service. So some of our topics of today, um, we talked quite a bit on the back end about what we want to do, and we all agreed, though, on one thing. We do not want to talk about COVID-19. So let's get back to talking about systems again. Um, and so we decided we're going to talk mostly about cooling towers since it is the summer and uh, what the purpose of treating cooling towers is, scale prevention and remediation, um, and then get into a little bit of nuts and bolts. Um, so some bleed equipment and set points, ideal situation equipment, uh, third generation treatment alternatives, and for those of you who've been part of my other seminars, um, this alternative treatment is not just about saying be cautious, and then some biocide choices and safety. Um, we also have a few updates as um, in March, ASHRAE 12 2020 came out and you've heard me talk about ASHRAE 188, especially if you're a member of the hall. And um, there's been some big legional updates as well as new certifications that are available. So just a few things I'll touch on there. So systems terminology today, pretty small here. We're gonna be talking about cooling towers, which are also fluid coolers and evaporative condensers. And of course, these systems can be very, very large, like the one you see on the left there, um, or it can be on your right, like the little tiny Evapco evaporative condenser that you can hug. Um, each one of these, though, can be using quite a bit of water and electricity. So that one on the right, um, it may surprise people, you could use over 100,000 gallons, maybe up to 200,000 gallons per cooling season on just a small one like that. Uh, that one on the left though, I would assume that's gonna be using in a standard commercial real estate um, environment, probably about between two and three million gallons. So a lot, a lot of water is going into this and for every gallon that goes into it, that water was moved, it was transferred, it went through a chiller. So there was a lot of electricity that went to it as well. So what's the point of water treatment? And this is something most of your members, of course, are already very familiar with. Um, it's to maximize systems, life, efficiency, and reliability. So at the very, very start of water treatment. We know if we put something in water, it does a four letter word, it rusts. And so the first thing is just to prevent systems from falling apart. Um, but of course, in addition, we now look at, well, can we make our systems more efficient? 
and so minimize the total operating cost. This is the fuel, um, if we're talking about steam boilers, or in chillers and cooling towers, we're mostly talking about electricity and water. And of course, the big one, at least in the city of Chicago, and in Chicago land for the most part, is electricity. Uh, it's always nice to have water conservation, but frankly, at $7 per thousand gallons, um, that is not very much money when we look at the massive amount of money that's coming from electricity. And, um, and of course, cost of repairs and unexpected shutdowns. Water treatment is a preventative maintenance. And the thing I like to say about preventative maintenance, it's like changing the oil in your car. You either can choose when you're going to change it, so I'm going to schedule it next Tuesday at 9 a.m., and that's when I'm going to change my oil, or it's going to choose it for you. So you're going to be driving down the highway and um, you're going to have a problem because you didn't change your oil and it's going to choose when you have to deal with it. So it's either um, you pick it out beforehand and you deal with it or it decides when you're going to deal with it. So first off, life expectancy considerations. Whenever I show this slide to people in Chicago and um, typically they're a bit surprised because the spec in cooling tower, um, especially a galvanized one, per manufacturer, it only lasts 15 years. Now, um, most engineers in Chicago, um, especially because of the training that's done here, I would not ever see a galvanized tower um, at 15 years needing to be replaced. That'd be very, very rare. When I go and do these talks in other regions, um, partially because of the water quality, but a much larger portion because they don't have the training um, and expertise there, it's regular for a cooling tower to be almost a consumable. They run it with very little treatment, sometimes none, lasts for about 15 years, and um, at the end of that, it's falling apart. Um, a stainless steel cooling tower is actually specced at 30 years. Now, in the city of Chicago, I have yet to see a stainless steel cooling tower basin be replaced. So um, I'm assuming in the city of Chicago, we're going to see these lasting for 50, 60 years. But um, we're also thinking about not just the actual cooling tower basin and the device, but also your circulation pipes. Between your cooling tower and the chillers, there may be thousands upon thousands of feet of pipes, which are very expensive to get to and replace. Um, and But if you look at an untreated tower in the city of Chicago, and this picture on the right actually was um, an untreated tower. The mechanical contractor was doing a uh, rehab and so installed a brand new, and you can see by the little bit of corrosion on that right there, um, so the white corrosion, this was a galvanized sump, and um, the mechanical contractor set it up did a subcontract with the water treatment firm, which is very common as most of you knew in the city of Chicago. And um, the water treatment company forgot to assign a tech. So um, I just happened to be called into that particular facility to look at what, what's going on here. And um, we saw there was brand new equipment, um, three, uh, three drums of chemistry ready to be set in and pumped in. However, it never was. And so this was just after three months. So it was around June or July um, that I'd snapped that picture of a brand new cooling tower that was always already rusting apart. So um, water treatment, one of those things, it's great to have. Um, if you don't have it though, it's go you're gonna pay for that very quickly. But then there's a business case for maintaining a cooling tower with excellent water treatment. So at a bare minimum, we know that we've got to um, have water treatment on just for the equipment life, but also we have to think about, well, does this cost us energy if we're running it inefficiently? And of course, um, this is a classic example. You can Google this and see um, this particular example is used by, um, I've seen it everywhere from uh, the Department of Energy's website to various different water treaters. And it's looking at a 500 ton chiller. And if we look at this graph here, um, 500 ton chiller, load factor 100%. So this would be a factory operating hours, 6570, so 18 hours a day. And then they have electricity rate, which uh, is, is variable. But they looked at this particular chiller cost $200,000 per year, um, just below, just below 200,000. 
at a deposit thickness of 0 0.01 inches, which I don't have an example with me. Um, the closest I can do is um, 1 32nd of an inch, that's a business card. 0 0.01 inches of scale was a 9% efficiency loss. So $17,000 in increased energy costs. And of course, as the deposit thickness increases, the efficiency loss comes greater and greater and greater. Now, one thing you do with your own systems is look at the difference between electricity um, in the summer months and the winter months because that average electricity should go up quite a bit unless you're on electric heating, but it typically is going to go up uh, about 25 to 35%. And you can assume most of the electricity is actually from the, um, your air conditioning systems. So by having a much, much better uh, water treatment where you're having none of that thickness when you open up the chillers at the end of the year, all of a sudden you can think about, well, could this be saving several thousand dollars in electricity? One other point I'm gonna throw, this um, efficiency loss and deposit thickness is from calcium carbonate, which is the standard scale that we get in the city of Chicago but biofilm is up to four times as insulating as that. Biofilm is the stuff that forms when you don't have a proper biocide package. It's also present on every single water supply. So when you are waking up and brushing your teeth, you're literally brushing off biofilm. But that biofilm, um, a little bacteria, is going to grow inside your chiller. And um, if it's not removed, if you don't have a good biocide package, that is also gonna cause um, efficiency problems. Just some other Department of Energy findings before I pop into some more nuts and bolts. Um, these are just some big pictures. 40% of energy costs for the average commercial building are spent on HVAC. This is about seven and a half total building costs. And um, air conditioning represents 9% of total electricity usage. And of course, this is very concerning when we're looking at um, climate change and most of our electricity comes from fossil fuels. So if 9% of our total electricity is just for air conditioning, um, that's a big, big item that we wanna look at. So typical problems in cooling towers, and I can only remember three things at a time. So I always like to put them in threes. Scale and deposits are number one, um, microbiological growth and corrosion. These are just basic problems that we have in every cooling tower if they're not properly treated. And also if you have questions on the meantime, I should also mention um, there is the Q&A that you can click on and uh, feel free to type in questions. I have a few other of um, my, uh, I believe, uh, colleagues that are scrolling through those. And um, if there's any questions that are important to get to at the end, I'll read those off and because we'll, this is only gonna take about 45 minutes and we'll have 15 minutes for questions at the end here. But um, scale and cooling towers, these are two different pictures of scale. One is some really bad scale on the right here on the fill. The other one though shows really how scale forms. This is on the coils of an evaporative condenser. And you can see on those various coils, scale started to develop on each one of those. Um, and that one in particular, it's copper and you see that scale has a greenish hue. So we know there's actually scale and corrosion going on in that evaporative condenser. And of course, we can think about if our, that scale continued to grow, that would slow down the heat transfer efficiency. If you'd like to do a quick experiment on home to see how much heat transfer efficiency is ruined by scale, um, actually all you have to do is grab an eggshell. If you put an eggshell over fire and then put your finger into it, you'll notice that you can probably leave your finger in the eggshell for quite a bit of time. An eggshell is calcium carbonate, same stuff that our bones are made of as well. And so it's very heat insulating. It also doesn't um, conduct electricity very well either. Um, so scale and cooling towers, so we know that reduces heat transfer efficiency, so increases your total cost of usage on this equipment. Um, it can also result in under deposit corrosion, which we saw in that previous picture. The one thing we haven't talked about though is it provides a perfect shelter for bacteria and biofilm. And so you can see that this particular cooling tower here has that very green hue at the bottom. And that is from algae growing. And um, when I have a ton of scale that's at the bottom of the sump, 
um, basically what will happen is it will form this wonderful web for bacteria to grow. On this particular tower, it was one that was being cleaned up and um, we were just getting tons and tons of scale as we were cleaning it up. And um, we got there one time and there was two inches thick of sandy scale at the bottom of this particular cooling tower. Now, um, what we did is we opened up a drain on the roof to, to kind of get that out of there. But um, when we first opened up, I noticed that the recirculating water temperature was about 75 degrees. The uh, temperature inside that scale, because I immediately, I'm just curious, so I stuck my hand in there, um, was well above 90 degrees. And that's because that scale is very insulating. And so all the heat from the sun on that day was actually keeping, um, trapping that heat inside that biofilm and that scale there. And so um, they actually put that particular cooling tower at a very high risk for Legionella because of all that scale on the bottom. Um, all that scale on the bottom, not only are my biocides not penetrating it, but also it was left at a hotter temperature. So put in Legionella's ideal range. Um, and one other thing here, so uh, scale. So in addition to the energy efficiency, um, chipping scale can result in just really annoying problems, right? Um, so uh, plug nozzles, broken fill, so your sprayer nozzles may not work as well. Um, so just all sorts of little problems. And so how to prevent? Um, so preventing is always better than trying to clean up. Um, preventive maintenance, it's either you choose it now or it will choose what time um, you have to deal with it. But so um, proper bleed and cycles of concentration, which are pretty standard in the city of Chicago since most of us are using Lake Michigan and proper chemistry feeds are really the most ideal ways to prevent scale. And of course, remediation cleaning um, and preventive cleaning once a year also helps prevent some of those big scale. And you can see this guy is uh, spraying cooling tower fill um, with some sort of inhibited acid. And we have those sort of options available, which are fantastic. So with bleed and with our, um, as some may refer to as uh, cooling tower blowdown, what we're doing is we are intentionally removing concentrated water to let in fresh water because chemistry has a limit. Once chemistry, once our water is concentrated enough with the minerals coming in, there is nothing my chemistry can do to prevent it. We are merely looking to slow things down. And so a question I get all the time is, what should my conductivity be at? And um, in the city of Chicago, that's a pretty wide question. Um, I put on here, wide range from a thousand to three thousands. So our standard cooling tower, I know nothing about. Usually um, in the city of Chicago, it's been a rule of thumb for a long time, throw it at a thousand because that's at about um, triple the concentration of minerals that are coming in from the city. And so about three to four times. Um, and so it's a great, great spot to start and then see if we want to push our water savings further. But the control limits and customization can be done quite a bit differently. So for example, if we have pretreatment, we may be able to increase that quite a bit, um, depending on the design of the system. So I have an evaporative condenser instead of a cooling tower system, um, I might push that conductivity a bit higher because an evaporative condenser has much less water volume. And um, so that's where we should really be. If you're looking for a quick, um, you know, what is ideal, um, you know, ask your water treater to see and be specific about the goals. Are we looking to save on water or are we looking to prevent any possibility of scale growing? Because it is a tightrope that we're trying to um, move here. Um, on bleed equipment, it, these are usually set up to a controller nowadays, but um, you have usually a conductivity meter, which is industry standard, and then a solenoid or motorized ball valve, which um, actually is the physical valve bleeding the water down. Out of the two here, we used to see a lot more of these on the left, these solenoids, but we've been specking more and more of these out. Cooling towers are gigantic air scrubbers, and they're bringing in everything from construction and debris to uh, twigs and dead pigeons. So um, these little solenoids I found will often plug off or they will plug on due to 
um, something getting jammed in there. And no joke, I have pulled out a pigeon bone, bone before. Um, so these can get plugged very, very easily. Um, one thing that we've found that's prevented a lot of that is on the right here, um, uh, a motorized ball valve. It has a physical spring in it that will close and also it closes shut. So if there is a problem and it loses power, it's always going to fail with that spring pushing it down and crushing anything um, that might keep it closed. So um, on systems that we've uh, had consistent problems where we'll come in, we'll see, huh, my conductivity is much lower than I had it set for, what's going on? Oftentimes it can be the solenoid is running um, too long or getting jammed. So one thing to keep in mind there. Um, ways to feed chemical, I'm gonna put this uh, also a little teaser out, second generation of chemistry here. Um, the one thing you do, and this is one thing that we all know here, we can always do everything manual. So at the end of the day, um, you know, we can physically go and move chemical around and pour in chemical and, um, you know, do our tests that way. And in tight situations, I've even set up a manual bleed um, using um, a siphon and a hose. So if worse comes to worse, you can do everything manually. But of course, there's big concerns with safety and chemistry. So at the next level, we look at our methods like timed and bleed and feed. And this would be using um, a little Christmas tree timer like on the right here, and it will feed your chemical two or three times a day automatically, and then you adjust the pumps back and forth. That's a good first step if you've got nothing else to do, um, or nothing else you can do, I should say. Um, so it's a very, very inexpensive step, and it puts some automation and it's going to at least relieve your um, engineers, you know, from having, and it's usually put on the, um, the lowest on the totem pole in your building to add the chemistry in physically or manually. And um, you don't want to do that. It's just too dangerous nowadays. So if you can put it at least on a pump and a timer, that's something. Um, but the industry standard nowadays is water meter and proportional. And um, this is having a water meter, which you can see in the middle of that, and then some controller. The water meter talks to the controller. The controller sees, oh, we've had a thousand gallons of makeup go in. Let me feed the system. Um, but now there's one more uh, technology, and it's really not new, but in water treatment, um, it's fairly new, being about 10, 15 years old, and it's called PTSA control. And so this is something where we can look at what the exact amount of chemistry is in your system to the parts per billion. Um, and it's using a dye inserted. And so now we can see exactly how much is in there and um, dose it that way. And it really takes out a lot of some of the problems with testing. Um, you can see right here, I've got a little vessel and some of you may be familiar with these little um, tabs put a tab in the water, shake it around, put your drops in, and that's how you try to determine how much chemistry is. If I were to have just a conference call between members of AWT on the different types called OP testing, if I were to have a conference call with those people and we all discuss what we like um, least about that test, it would go on for hours and hours. So it's a very, very tough test and we don't really love it because it takes a lot of finagling in order to understand. This one, you put the water in, it comes up with a number. And there's several different devices to do it. Um, you can see this SP300. Uh, Most of my techs carry around this one in SP710 now it's on. And so it's a great device for being able to check the chemistry. In addition to having that handheld device though, we can also put in a probe. And that probe is going to toss the controller at all times and keep everything in range. The biggest advantage of these, easier operator testing and control, and also you have the exact same chemistry at all times. So very, very effective stuff. Um, feel free to ask your water treater about them because even if you're not on one of these newer controllers, you can at least ask your water treater, hey, do you have um, PTSA dye in here? So we can do operator testing you know, once or twice a week with this um, at a much better calibration of testing. Um, next, I'm gonna pop into containment and safety here. 
Now, most of your facilities are not built in ideal situations. Um, a lot of these mechanical rooms were clearly afterthoughts. So it was, oh yeah, they don't have to, you know, put up 55 gallon drums of glycol in there. Of course not. It's not a problem to just have, um, you know, those uh, taken upstairs. And so many difficult to access areas and can't handle large quantities. And so there's a couple different options for you out there on the market. Um, one is a solids program. And I point this out because um, this was, for example, on the bottom left here was a picture I took um, when moving chemistry around an office space. And we've had clients ask us before, hey, if you're delivering chemistry, can it, be, can it have a blanket over it? So when I'm moving it through the, um, the tenant spaces, they don't notice anything. Um, I've even had my own building complain to me when I have chemistry shipped to me, and they say, why are there all these skull and crossbones over, um, over this stuff that's sitting in the package room? Okay, I'll get out. Um, and so a lot of people get chemophilia or really, really scared of seeing chemistry in um, a tenant area. And so um, a salads program was one of the first ones we came up with. And um, these come in these mayonnaise jars type uh, situations and um, you put them in a um, holder and it sprays water up and generates your chemistry on site. One of the nice things about these is you can have it in a box carried across um, your facility. The big negative, and I have these um, particular, uh, I, this picture is literally to show the pipes. Um, you need to actually put water going to it. And so it requires a bit more plumbing. And so what we've done is we've looked at ultra concentrates as our solution to this. Um, and they come in one gallon containers that can come in just a box. Um, and so you can just carry this box across uh, the facility. Um, one box of chemistry is roughly um, about three or four times as concentrated. And so we look at uh, a box being about 15 to 30 gallons worth of chemistry. So very, very concentrated um, compared with what we have had before. We can often use the same pumps so we don't have to remove any infrastructure that you currently had. And um, the infrastructure is literally just putting up um, these five gallon containers. The other nice I'm thing about having- Oh, sure. We have a, a question in the chat. Does the probe corrode interfering with proper chemical levels? Um, does the PTSA probe corrode? Um, I'm assuming we're talking about PTSA probes. Does it corrode and can that interfere? Um, just like all probes, absolutely, it can. Um, so it can, um, it can be biofilmed up, it can be fouled up, it can be also, um, it can, um, you know, have um, some, it has a life expectancy to it as well. And so um, that's a great question. And so with all this automation or with all this advanced treatment, it's not removing um, the need to still do spot testing. So if you have this um, particular uh, PTSA probe in, we also recommend, hey, let's also get a handheld device so then you can double check against it. And so great question there. But what that probe does, as long as it is, um, you know, properly calibrated, your chemistry is totally flat across the systems. So it prevents a flywheel effect. So that flywheel effect, of course, is your chemistry being overfed, then underfed, overfed, underfed. And that's what causes some of the problems in scale. So um, great question there. Um, I hope that answers it. And, uh, but typically what we've seen in the field is I've had these PTSA probes in about three to four years on most systems. Some are older. And I rarely replace them, especially the newer ones are Bluetooth. So I can actually control it through uh, my phone and adjust it. Um, I've yet to replace any that are three or four years old, at least on City of Chicago water. Um, but so moving back over here to the Apex concentrate, low weight, small footprint, um, also less transportation costs because we're just shipping one gallon of concentrated chemical instead of shipping 15 gallons in a bucket. And so um, much less in, con in uh, transportation. And also if I'm moving it to a, um, 
particular area that's hard to get. So for example, up a ladder, or um, uh, for example, we just um, set up a bunch of retail stores and these retail stores all have cooling towers in odd places on the roof or in the rafters. So clearly no one's um, been uh, really managing it um, for a little bit. Um, and so all these hard to uh, get to spots. And so by just having these one gowns, we can bring those up easily. Um, if you're not looking at one of those, so if you have an ideal situation where you can simply just roll chemistry to wherever you need it, um, we always recommend dual containment. And this is recommended on anything above five gallons worth of actual product, that you have some sort of form of dual containment. This shows a nice ideal setup. You have three tanks. Um, everything is close by. All of the um, particular tubes are fairly neat on this one, and it reduces your spill chance much cleaner mechanical room. So as someone's walking around, um, you, know, you usually don't have large, it's a big no-no to have anything when you're walking around have an open container. Um, and so our water treatment chemistry though, we know it is an open container because it's always pumping slowly and continuously. And so having that nice clean dual containment, if someone's eyes glance over at this, they're going to think, hey, everything's together, everything's safe. Um, and I have a few examples where you'll see that, well, you don't get that nice feeling. And also dual containment allows for free, uh, hands-free delivery, which is fantastic. So then your operators don't need to touch any of the chemistry. Um, one thing I always point out here, if you're still feeding into the um, four inch or in most cases, 12 inch um, cooling tower, um, mains. I recommend against that because uh, this particular one, um, both of these actually clogged up from scale and um, no one had quite noticed it until um, we were really trying to troubleshoot the, um, the pump and the tube actually exploded out of it. And so our look in horror is, oh no, what if that back check valve fails because we've got literally 10,000 gallons of water on top of us. Um, so fortunately it did not there, but we strongly recommend always going to side stream and that's on the right here. And you can see all of your pumps are neatly aligned and every single um, chemical feed is straight into the side stream. The other nice thing about that, if you are fixing for side stream, I know me, if a problem is easier to fix, I'm more likely to get that fix immediately. So if there is a problem, and for example, sodium hypochlorite is very common to start forming some gunk um, and uh, clogging up, and some of our chemistries are as well. Um, other chemistries, I should say, are regularly known to gunk up. Um, you can easily pop that out, clean it out, put it back in. Um, this is always my picture of what not to do. And so please, 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 if your system looks like this, um, well, there are many, many ways we can improve this. At the very basic was remove that uh, drum from the chair, but please do not have your uh, 15 gallons of chemistry on a chair. We've had another couple of questions come into Oh, sure. Um, has Global Water Service a composite the cooling tower? If so, is it handled differently than a galvanized or stainless steel constructed tower? So have we serviced a composite cooling tower? You know, that's a great question. And um, for example, we have actually one um, up in Medline that's a factory with um, four of them all lined up, um, which is the last one of them I was at. But yep, yeah, so cooling towers are going to come in stainless steel, um, galvanized, uh, composite, um, power, um, some forms of uh, different uh, fiberglass um, that's really popular in Australia. And also um, we even have wood cooling towers still. So yes, um, we have uh, done every sort of treatment. And when it comes to uh, that particular one, the scale and corrosion principles are going to be very similar. So um, everything you've seen in here is going to be almost the same. The one nice thing about something like a composite is if you wanted to feed um, something that was a little bit harsher, depending on your chiller, you might be able to get um, through with it. So, but um, for the nuts and bolts on that, um, I'd be definitely happy to um, 
to go over that on the uh, back end there. Awesome, thank you. And then one more question. Um, does Global Water have a recommended incubator to provide a stable environment for dip slide samples? Recommend incubator? Um, yep, yeah. so we have about like three suppliers and so we can quote one out for you. Um, it's, so I mean, my recommended incubator, I usually just throw it in my pocket, no. Um, but uh, yes, we have several incubators and um, they're all a little bit pricey, but it is worth it for dip slides. Thank you. Um, and so third generation chemical treatments, um, and this is how I put um, water treatment with cooling towers. If we're really going back to first generation, um, we would be talking about steam boilers and potatoes. That was literally the first type of water treatment that was there. They would leave potatoes in the boiler, but um, we're going with cooling towers today, which the first one was really chromates that were used heavily. Um, those were banned um, due to being very toxic. Um, second generation, which we're on right now, is phosphates and biocide. And now for the third generation, there are very many contenders. And you can see this uh, magazine called The Analyst on the right here, Voice of the Water Treatment Industry. That is my technical mag magazine that I get, um, you know, every couple of months. And um, literally every single month, there is some new thing that they are trying. And at the end of the day, it's always coming back to, well, does it work? Usually it does, but is it economical for most systems? Because what's economical for one system may not be for another. What's economic in one area may not be for another. And so it always comes back to that. And uh, you can see all of these, there's especially a lot of devices that come out. Um, and for example, the Dolphin, I've spec'd out probably about 10 of those because they didn't work on Chicago water. Um, and so the one that we're um, experimenting with right now, and I'm kind of excited about it, um, is Mexel, and it's a pipe barrier treatment. And so um, especially we've heard good, um, good reviews and great economics coming from very large systems. Um, but uh, basically what it does is it's not looking at treating the water itself. It's looking at adhering to the pipe and you can see this picture on the um the right um the bottom right here it basically forms this protective cell or protective film around the entire um system and prevents um for example dissolved oxygen from corroding the system but also prevents scale from adhering to it if scale were to form so um, from what we've seen in a lot of especially data centers, this has worked out fantastically because it's a one chemical system, um, it's a one treatment approach, prevents scale corrosion and biofilm from adhering to the surfaces. And the other thing I like about this one is this wasn't um, directly marketed at the mid market. And uh, what we call the mid market is what we're in right now. So. Um, Commercial real estate is a mid-market. Uh, data centers is a mid-market. Heavy market is power generation. So um, a, a massive power plant, for example. And then the small market is residential. So we're mid-market. But um, these came to us from the quote unquote um, big market. And so if, this, if something like this works in a power generation, we know that at least at the very basic, it works. What we don't know is it economic, and that's what we're going to start um, experimenting with. And so, um, Nexel 435, a cooling tower treatment, it's also EPA certified for use as a biocide, which is one of the first ones to have an all in one that can be um, used as a biocide. In fact, Janet Stout, um, who I'll talk about a little bit later, had good comments about it. it prevents biofilm scale, corrosion, and um, effective towards Legionella. So um, feel free to ask us any questions about that or see if your building um, would be interested in being one of the first ones to be on this because um, we've just seen outstanding results so far. And we do have a question. Is, is yep. Mexel more of a startup product? Um, Mexel is a treatment for um, at any time. So one of the interesting things about it, if you're looking to keep a system clean, it um, has this adherence to it. So, um, you know, if you have, I would think it's perfect for a brand new galvanized tower because part of the galvanization process is that passivation and trying, trying, trying to stop um, 
the water from destroying the galvanized layer during passivation. So I could think that's a wonderful product for it, but it's also excellent in certain products or certain systems that have been neglected over periods of time because it's going to actually, um, uh, it acts like a magnet going directly towards the pipe wall. And so then it's going to remove anything that gets in its way. And that includes some scale, that includes biofilm. So really interesting product. So either um, existing, um, existing system or brand new. And the Maxwell is something that you're offering now. You said you could. Um, Correct. Okay, great. Like people could reach out to you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we can put together just a quick cost, cost estimate on um, what you're currently on, um, what a like to like would be, and then what this Mexcel would be. Um, one other thing, I really don't have time for this. Pre-treatment though, in um, you know, what I call difficult buildings. Um, so some of you guys are on buildings that are quite old now. And so um, you may have a 120 year old building that has the same cooling tower equipment or same or circulation pipes at least for the last, um, you know, 120 years. And so in these type of buildings, a little bit of hardness will slowly gather around all the pipe surfaces. So one thing to think about if you're having constant scale problems because your cooling tower is usually at the top of the building, your, um, your chiller is at the bottom of the building. So you have literally 15,000 gallons, possibly more of water that can cause um, all sorts of scale corrosion, biofilm, you name it. Um, one thing to think about is pretreatment. And so we use water softeners regularly in uh, steam boilers, but we can also use them in cooling towers. And we've had a lot of success if we've done this in buildings that have had existing scale problems, and especially these buildings that have a very large amount of water. Um, because we know that the actual water age, the time it takes from water to go in the building and either be bled out or evaporate out um, is very long. If we look at an evaporative condenser or something that has a small volume, that water age it could be um, only just a few hours. So the full volume of water um, um, completely is evaporated or bleeds out several times a day. Whereas in these type of buildings, we'll often see some problems and because it may take a week for that water to enter the building and exit either through the drain or through evaporation. Um, remediation, if you're looking to quickly remediate scale, um, inhibited acids are always one um, option. And the one we recommend is Ridlime, which we can quote out in five, five gallons to tote size for you. We have um, a bulk discount. And um, what is really nice about this product, it's um, safe to use. So if you spray it over, and so if you're using a sprayer and it splashes on you, there's actually no safety hazard with your skin. Um, the manufacturing rep will actually come out and uh, they will handle red line using no gloves, which is something that, I mean, I can't even do for this own webinar is show a test because I would have to glove up and glass up um, in order to show our water treatment testing. It's also recommended that cooling towers are cleaned every six months and have a regular visual inspection. Scale breakups, so if you are breaking up scale, one thing I'll always mention is it gets worse before it gets better. So if you're having this big thick scale breakup like that, and you can tell that's all old scale, um, be on the lookout for it. Um, my favorite tool to get rid of this particular one is a floor drain on the cooling tower and a broom. Just get that stuff out of there. Um, here we're going to pop in some microbiological growth and um, the big recommendation that I have for everyone here is use a dual biocide. And so you have to use an oxidizing biocide in every cooling tower as a basics. So that could be a chlorine solution, a bromine solution, or a combination. But then there's other non-oxidizing biocides. Um, there, if I were to do the whole list, it would be quite long, but what's mostly used in Chicagoland, um, at least from not from global, is either glutaraldehyde or isothiazolin. Isothiazolin is a really, really bad product to use in commercial real estate. Um, and here's the reason I say this, it's a sensitizer. If this stuff gets on you in a very large amount and people in my industry have gone this, um, have just worked about this, never had a spill, they say it's called, um, it, 
makes you sensitive to even being around this stuff or in small amounts. Isothazlin is normally used as the antibacterial agent that's put into shampoos, um, hand creams, sunscreen, all sorts of skincare products. And those skincare products would grow bacteria without just a little bit in. Um, this, the amount that's in there is usually less than um, you know, one one hundredth or one one thousandth sometimes of a percent. But just that little bit can make someone start breaking out if you've had a bad experience with isothazlin. So what they've said is a large, um, a large exposure to it. But I have people in my industry who have said they've never had a large exposure, but have now become allergic to it. So that's one reason I don't recommend it. Um, glutaraldehyde is another common one used. Um, and it's a very good product, except for it has a very bad smell. So if it overfeeds or if it spills, it can lead to a lot of remediation. The one I recommend is Bellicide 355. Um, as the old saying goes, good, fast, cheap, you get to choose two. Um, Bellicide is good, it works fast, it's a little bit more expensive. We still provide this to all of our contract customers because we think it's a better product and we don't have to use very much, but um, it is just the most expensive of those products, but it works very well, does not have the same safety concerns. PPE on cooling tower cleaning. Um, if you can find one, an N95 dust mask is still recommended on these um, because it's actually been considered a low risk for cleaning cooling towers um, in terms of Legionella. However, we do recommend if you're gonna clean your cooling tower out, um, make sure you have a biocide program going in there first. What we recommend to all of our customers or when we do our own cooling tower cleanings, we put in a sterilization procedure first. And if you'd like one for free, that's something I can send you no problem. Um, when it comes to testing, I'm gonna have to slide through this a little bit, but um, basically you have, oops, sorry. Um, when you're looking at these different test items, um, many people ask me, Brian, how often should our operators test? And of course that de depends. How many people do you have on staff? How much time can you devote to it? And then how critical is the equipment? Um, if you're a data center that has literally, um, you know, 10,000 tons of cooling, I'm probably gonna recommend every shift of this should be tested. But if you're a commercial real estate building with a 400 ton cooling tower, it's still an important piece of advice because it's critical to your air conditioning. However, the, um, the exact um, nature of that is not going to, um, it's not going to fall apart as quickly if things are out of control. So if we um, look at our control times, I usually say for most people, three times a week is excellent. And you can use a variety of different um, tests. I have um, you know, some drop tests here, and you can see you know, my different, uh, my different um, drop test items, or you can get something that's a little bit more robust, something like this, which will do everything electronically, and um, so there's no interpretation. So there's lots of different options, but definitely ask your water treater if you haven't, and if you're not operating operator testing, ask them, how often should I be testing? And also it's an excellent thing to add on if you're looking to um, you know, uh, have just a little bit more control and a little bit more documentation on how are we taking care of this equipment. Um, I can go over this. Just some other troubleshooting checklists and tips. Um, as I'm going around a mechanical room, this is what I think about. Are all my pumps primed and operating? On a pump, if I'm hearing a thun, 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 that is means that it's operating properly. If I are a click, 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 that means that it's not. So um, make sure all your pumps are primed. Um, have a water meter on all your um, tower makeup. And the ultimate thing you can ever do is just check to make sure that the chemical usage is going on. Because I can do a drop test um, or I can do any sort of testing that I want here. And um, unfortunately, there are interferences in every test that we do. And these interferences can make you think that, hey, we've got um, proper chemical, we're doing okay here. But in reality, because of the interference, you may be off. But if you notice the chemistry is going down um, and you have a water meter, your water treater can come by and say, you know what, I'm gonna do some quick calcs. You've had 100,000 gallons go through that of water. That means you should have 
15 gallons of chemistry be used. And that's the base validation for all the water treatment. Um, testing tips, I really don't have too much time because I wanted to get through here, but the one thing I'll say, please wear your PPE when doing the testing. Um, and uh, also, I brought these two here. So if your um, test tube looks like this one, please ask your water treater for a fresh one. So um, this one, you're not gonna be able to see the color changes out of. And I even yelled at my own text for having dirty um, plasticware or glassware. So reasonable practices from cooling towers. Um, the one thing that I didn't bring up too much is physical inspection is probably the best way to do it, to put a test on your tower if you have an open sump. We recommend dual biocides and also the tower is recommended to be physically cleaned um, every six months of regular use. Now, if you're looking at lesional testing and you haven't already, what we recommend um, or what's recommended from um, various institutes is test every three months. For those of you who are seasonal, I recommend testing one week um, or within about a week of startup or of regular use. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly one week, but what you wanna show is that all of your controls are working. And um, if you do that legional test right after about a week, um, within one month of startup, you can show that, yes, we have our controls in place, everything's working, and we have no Legionella. The next step is to test sometime in midsummer. So around right now, when it's very hot out, when your system is working as hard as possible. And what that's going to do is not only validate that your system was good to start up, but your system was good at the highest demands. If you're um, a seasonal one and you're looking to shut down in mid-October, for example, it may not be in your best interest or may not be economically feasible to take a test in October when it's you know just a day or two before shutdown. So um, that's just some things to keep in mind. Most of my clients who have seasonal towers do two tests a year, one right after startup, one in the middle of summer. Um, and just some final updates about Legionella and um, ASHRAE. So um, a water management plan is still recommended as the best best option for preventing Legionella. And this is looking at not just your cooling tower water, um, but also all your domestic systems as well. CDC Vital Signs, that's the magazine the CDC puts out. It's very, very interesting to read. Um, nine in 10 um, Legionella failures they found, or Legionella disease outbreaks, or um, Legionnaire's disease outbreaks, the word I'm looking for, not Legionella. Um, are actually due to process failures. And one of the big ones they put in, put in was just not having a Legionella water management plan. So the way I interpret that, if you have a water management plan in place, just in general, then at least nine times out of 10, you're gonna catch all of these basics that, have, that lead to Legionnaire disease outbreaks. Um, and there's a bunch of other great statistics. But the big one here is ASHRAE 12 2020 is now available. And so um, 12 2020 is different from 188. 188 uh, provided a skeleton of what needs to be in a water management plan. ASHRAE 12 2020 provides much more details about, well, that's the skeleton. Now here's what should be in the skeleton. What these don't do though still is tell you exactly, unless you're experienced in doing water management plans, what you should do to remediate. Um, it's a very, very good document. If you um, download this, put in all your um, different information, but where an expert still needed, what happens if you test and you have Legionella? Because these systems still do not do a very good job of telling you what you should do. So if you have a water management plan, ask your water treater if your water management plan is up to date, which ASHRAE 2020, um, because it does provide much better framework um, than ASHRAE 188 did. Um, but both are still um, very, very much in use. Um, there's also some certifications. If you have a water management plan, if you're thinking about getting a water management plan, um, what you should think about, number one, is your water treater um, a certified water technologist or do they have them on staff when developing these? Um, this is one that many Legionnaire disease laboratories have recommended. Um, the other one is something new, it's called, um, ASSE or ANSI um, 1280 for Legionella Water Safety and Management Personnel. 
It is a certification um, that is brand new, that's meant, and this is a direct quote here, uh, the first official certificate from ASSE um, for regional water management plans. And uh, these quotes from Jan Stout, and the reason why I mention her a lot, she's kind of a big deal in Legionella because she's the actual person who first isolated the bacteria Legionella and named it. So um, she owns one of the largest laboratories of testing Legionnaire's disease and Legionella and investigating. So a lot of our information comes from her and she's sort of a quasi celebrity, what I call a W-list, water list celebrity in our world. But she said um, the certification um, uh, to the ASSE water management specialist standard means the job will be done right. So I recommend asking your water treater if you have a plan or if you're um, verifying or if you're thinking about getting one, um, how many people do you have that are ASSE 1280 certified? And since this is brand new, the first class is actually coming up. So right now, no one is. Um, next time we have this sort of webinar, um, at least I will be if I pass the exams, I guess. Um, but so I'm gonna go over some questions here. So it looks like we do have some questions in the mm -hmm. chat. I just want to let everyone know if your question doesn't get answered, we can have Brian follow up with you. We do have your email address. Um, so if we don't get to it, I know we only have a couple minutes left, he will follow up. So if you also, have- Also, yep. Yeah, I'm going to mention here, um, we are on LinkedIn and Facebook. I don't follow us on Facebook because I don't need my company seeing my Facebook, but um, you know, I do follow on LinkedIn and we uh, put out a lot of great things on there. So. Um, and a lot of interesting um, articles. So feel free to follow us or um, sign up for our newsletter. Awesome, thank you. If you have a spill, what can, uh, what can you use to clean up, clean it up, especially when it's sticking to the concrete floor? Ooh, you have a spill. Um, that is a very, very long answer. It depends on the chemistry and depends what the problem is. So um, if we're getting, for example, just stickiness, um, usually, um, you know, it's just water to dilute. But if you're getting something like a smell still, um, this is where it really depends on the chemistry. Uh, the first place I would look for, though, is the SDS. Um, see what they recommend. And then from there, we would need to do um, much more specific, um, much more specific detail because it could be one of you know two dozen chemistries and each one may have a little bit different of tips to it um, awesome. thank you so the next one here um, saying can I get the PowerPoint presentation um, how we'll be doing everything is I'll be sending everything over to Alex on here and then she'll be submitting everything out and one of the things I will send out is this presentation so absolutely um, and I believe, Alex, we're also doing a recording of this. We are, yes, we'll host this on our website. Lovely, If share with your kids. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's see, um, how often do coupon racks scale up and how do you mitigate this? So that is a great question. Coupon racks are by design meant to slow down flow because you need to regulate that flow. Um, how often do they scale up? You know, I have probably company-wide um, 1,000 coupon racks. I'm just making a number up. And um, I don't see it happen too often unless there's a specific strange mechanical process or reason for that. So the last time I had one scale up was because um, the controller, and this is company-wide here, the controller was feeding biocide and um, uh, inhibitor at the exact same time. And when you mix those two together, it doesn't, if you mix them together directly, you're going to have a very bad reaction. If you mix them together in the system, it's fine. It just, if they're mixed together too close, it kind of gums it up. And that was what was creating a scale. And so it did scale up the, coup uh, the coupon rack because the coupon rack was right after in the flow. Um, so it's not common to mitigate it. Um, usually I'd recommend see if you can physically clean it out. Um, if you can't, throw it through an inhibit acid. So something like Ridlime, you can simply just pump that through there, um, let it sit, and then try to get that out. Um, so I don't see that commonly happening, excuse me, unless there's some problem uh, with the flow regulator, because that particular flow regulator um, 
maybe malfunctioning and then not having enough flow go through it. And that's where all the, um, the gunk sort of uh, pops up. Um, in addition to coupon racks though, one of the things you do if you're having constant issues with it for your particular system, you've tried moving it, you've tried everything, there are new um, corrosion probes you can put in instead. So instead of having that, you know, check every three months on the corrosion rack, you can put in a probe and it does, um, it gives you a live feed out of what the corrosion rate is in the system. And um, usually when I'm trending these with corrosion racks, I'm seeing a total correlation between the two. It's very rare that I wouldn't when see that. So um, that's one other option you have if you're looking to just get rid of the, the coupon wrap, but keep some sort of third party analysis in there. Any other questions? There are some questions in the chat. If, oh, okay. if you want to um, answer those, we can finish out the recording. Anyone else is welcome to stay on the line to hear the answers as well. Um, our class is something engineers expect to take. Um, our classes, something engineers are expected to take. Um, great question. I think you're talking about ASSE um, 1280 here. Um, these are not expected for engineers to take. These are expected for people who are putting together water management plans. Um, does GWT build diaphragm pumps or at a minimum provide critical pump parts um, of their typical service contract? Does GWT recommend a specific cooling tower cleaning program, clean Kevin's method? Um, yes to all. So we rebuild diaphragm pumps. Uh, typically most diaphragm pumps, especially something like a pulse feeder, um, they've kept their same, and I love pulse feeder because they've kept their same basic parts the same for about 20 years. And so you can uh, go through the process of, okay, it's not working, so let's first rebuild it and then let's replace it. So um, Typically, we can get by with just rebuilding those. Some other brands, for example, LMI, um, the pump rebuild kit is, I want to say, about 700 the last time I had to quote it out. And that pump rebuild kit was actually more than buying a brand new pump from a uh, pulse feeder. And that was for the LMI. LMIs are known as being more expensive. So it depends. Um, do we provide uh, critical pump parts as part of the typical service contract? Um, typically, it depends on how it failed. So in most of these, if like, for example, um, let's say it's a three-way valve um, and it um, is brand new, then of course, or within a year old or a couple of years old, so within um, warranty period, then yes, we're going to uh, provide that. But if it's something that happened afterwards, and usually um, those parts start to fail after four, five, six years, um, then typically that's something that would be invoiced, but it depends on the service contract. Some, um, we own the equipment and service it. Others, the client owns the equipment. Does GWT recommend a specific cooling tower cleaning program, including chemicals methods? Um, we definitely can. So, um, but, Cooling tower cleaning program. Ooh, that's a tough question. So we do have a sheet, um, a one sheet on recommendations, but it's not a step-by-step -step procedure. But um, I can definitely send that to you. Um, does GWT recommend Ridline for plate frame heat exchangers? Actually, um, the one thing I really love about Ridline is you can put them into Alpha Laval plate and frame heat exchangers. If you look at um, the SDS on Ridline. It actually has hydrochloric acid. Now, it's not just hydrochloric acid, that's just one element in there. But um, as most people know, um, stainless steel can and hydrochloric acid do not get along well. If you want to get rid of stainless steel, immediately, um, immediately um, get, um, it will immediately eat through it. But so, um, yeah, Alpha Laval is the um, actually put out a um, certificate to Ridline saying it does not cause advanced corrosion. So yes, we definitely recommend uh, Ridline for plate frame heat exchangers. Has GWT been involved with the peroxide cleaning process of cooling tower? Yes, I have. Um, so the peroxide uh, cooling tower cleaning uh, program is usually recommended um, by um, certain companies. I've seen that spec sheet. Um, what the goal of that peroxide is to break up biofilm. So, um, you know, it's, I've seen it be effective, 
Um, on other instances, I've uh, gotten myself into trouble because I've overfed the peroxide um, per the recommendations or the sodium hypochlorite and just um, ended up with, um, with tons and tons of foaming. So the one thing I recommend if you're doing a peroxide cleaning process, make sure you have anti-foam. Any thoughts on pot feeders with string tube filters? Yeah, so string mount filter cartridges and uh, pot feeders, that's all great stuff for closed loops. So today was all about uh, cooling towers. And so with a cooling tower, um, you know, we usually wouldn't be using a pot feeder or string wound filter cartridge. Maybe at a, another one of these sessions, we'll just focus on closed loops. And when we talk about closed loops, we're talking about chiller side of the loop or a hot water boil, boiler side of the loop or possibly a condenser loop. But this one is just for the open um, cooling tower side. And, and I think you answered all of them in the chat now too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for, for this presentation. As Mike said, you do have an extraordinary amount of knowledge on this. Um, thank you to all who have attended. We will be sending out some follow-up information on the presentation um, to answer any questions and for you to utilize um, and to contact Brian. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone for joining on. Hey, nice job, Brian. Oh, thanks, John. Yeah, that was awesome. The great thing about this group is I am dealing with engineers who are all interested. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I think you had some engaged individuals, and people, yeah, like you said, that are interested. It's just, you know, you don't feel like you're talking to a wall, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, so we started doing these um, out of necessity in April, and then we, um, as our company has been growing, um, I've been doing things like flying out, um, driving out, um, all sorts of things like that, but um, with uh, this option, it sort of forced us to get yeah. something in, and then I was like, you know what, this can work pretty well, and I've done enough of these to, you know, kind of um, focus, okay, um, you're not going to get a reaction from the room. You're not allowed to, you know, go over the room. Okay, who has questions on this? Yeah. So yeah. some of the weirder things, but it's yeah. more of a monologue. You do a nice job of presenting too. I mean, I've, you know, we get a lot of people that are very monotone and you're not that, you know, so it's, uh, you do a nice job. It's so, good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very yeah, I've got, I've got a I've face got for radio, you. so. <laughs> Yeah, I've been told the same. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. You do fine. So, um, no, no, definitely. Uh, I, I felt you kept it engaging. It was nice.